Hello and welcome to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast sat firmly in the grey maybe of the series universe. My name is Aramithius, and today we're discussing one of the most contentious ways that mortals can become gods, and potentially some of the most famous results of that. Today we're asking, what is mantling, and how is Talos three people? Before we begin, I'm just going to give my usual disclaimer, just to remind everyone that this is my own understanding of the ideas I'm presenting, and not necessarily the whole truth of the matter, although I'll do my best to bring in other viewpoints as well. You may have other ideas, and if so, I'd absolutely love to hear them. Please leave a comment on the blog post that accompanies this cast, writteninuncertainty.wordpress.com or join the conversation at the Written and Uncertainty Discord. Just a note, I will also be linking all of the sources that I quote in this podcast in the blog post, so please go through and read the sources that I'm referencing rather than just taking what I say at face value. I'd also like to add something to last time's episode, if I may. I had a comment on the Artes Law subreddit that highlighted that I hadn't properly explained a few things, so I just wanted to catch people up on those. In particular, there was discussion of why the player characters disappear once they'd finished the events in the games that I didn't actually address. The commenter pointed out that I hadn't addressed the exile of the hero, as it was put. I admit I don't really know the precise theory that the commenter was referencing, because it sounded like they were talking about something that was a much bigger part of literature, but it feels like the alienation of the hero after the return to where they come from, but their comeback changed, if you remember the general sequence of events in A Hero's Journey. They are alienated from their context, from what they've gone through, because they're different, they're not the same person that leaves to go on the adventure as comes back. The hero in the Elder Scrolls has no context to be alienated from, but they do never stick around. Their actions still change them in the same way that the Observer in an Enantiomorph is maimed. We also have the insinuation in the Elder Scrolls 3 that we can occasionally have the hero being a scapegoat. One of the prophecies about the Nereverine says that they are to eat the sin of the Sixth House in the same way that the scapegoat takes the sin of the people of Israel and is then cast out into the desert. And if you remember the rumours that were flying around uh, in the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, the Nereverine is rumoured to have gone away to Akavir, which is bearing the sin of the Sixth House away to somewhere else, which feels very, very scapegoaty to me. It's not quite as explicit elsewhere, but it's similar. It's an outsider coming in, fixing a problem, never attaching themselves to the society in which they find themselves. They always remain an outsider. But now we should probably talk about what we're actually here for in this cast, mantling. So what is mantling? I want to take a little diversion here to talk about the root of the word. Uh, The term itself and the way it's generally used in English when you talk about someone taking on someone's mantle is taken from the Old Testament, specifically the second book of Kings, chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, to quote, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw them no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back, and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and smote the waters, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. To engage in a quick bit of biblical analysis here, in taking Elijah's mantle, in this case his cloak, Elisha is taking up Elijah's role as a prophet when he picks it up, as is seen in the way that he takes the cloak and then goes on to perform a miracle with it. This is the essence of what mantling is in the Elder Scrolls as well. It's taking on the role of another and thereby also assuming their power and status. And so where do we hear about all this in the series? It's not very often actually. There are hints at it in several places, but they're very rarely spelled out. 
one of the biggest places they are spelled out is in the 36 lessons of Vivek where mantling is numbered as one of the walking ways which Vivek also says are the formulas to heaven by violence in sermon 6. That sermon is also called the walking ways in the scripture of numbers in sermon 29. Reaching heaven in this sense is generally seen by some people as being a form of apotheosis becoming a god in that sort of sense. Pretty much all of the walking ways are used to transform the self to become a god if you like but note that that's not necessarily the same thing as becoming an etada. It's just a way of becoming something else, changing the kind of being that you are. But note that whether that makes you a god depends on exactly what your definition of a god is in the Elder Scrolls. Until I can get around to addressing that, please check out the Selective's Lorecast on this topic. It talks about it in some very, very good and helpful ways and I'll link it in the blog that goes alongside this cast. With regards to mantling, we're told that it's the fourth walking way called the Steps of the Dead in Sermon 32. To quote, The sage who is not an anvil, a conventional sentence and nothing more, by which I mean the dead, the fourth walking way. Now that's not quite mantling, but the fourth walking way is linked to mantling in a forum post by Michael Kirkbride which says this Tiber Septim the storm crown mantled by way of the fourth the steps of the dead mantling and incarnation are separate roads do not mistake this the latter is built from the cobbles of drawbone destiny the former walk like them until they must walk like you this is the death children bring as the sons of horror just a small digression here I've seen this particular passage read to mean that there may be different ways of mantling of which the steps of the dead is the fourth rather than there being different walking ways of which the steps of the dead and which is also mantling is the fourth. However, because of the quote from Sermon 32 which links the fourth to the steps of the dead and to the walking ways, I think it's far more likely that mantling is just the fourth walking way. So how do you actually do it? The most relevant part of the quote that we've just gone over that tells you how it's done is walk like them until they walk like you. It implies that someone who wishes to mantle someone else must imitate them, must do the things that they would do until they're essentially the same person. Put simply, it's a form of fake it until you make it, tricking the Arabist into thinking that you are the person that you've been trying to be. It's also a comment on identity, similar to what I talked about last time. The hero of each Elder Scrolls game is what they are because of what they do, not the other way around. Uh, The Elder Scrolls V has muddied the waters a bit here, but it feels very explicit in most places. In addition to imitation, mantling also seems to involve replacement. One of the best examples of mantling that we have is the Champion of Cyrodiil and Sheogorath, which even gets called out in the box art to the 5th anniversary edition of the game, I think. The precise quote there is, Do you have the strength to survive his trials, to tame a realm fraught with paranoia and despair, and wear the mantle of a god? Now this only happens when Sheogorath disappears and is replaced by Jigalag. The other case that we have for mantling is Talos, which is mostly taken to be that they're mantling Lorcan, who is the missing god. He's totally absent by his nature. So it's possible that mantling can only happen where there's a gap somewhere in the Arabis to be filled. We do, however, also have Michael Kirkbride posting as Vivek during the trial, which was a roleplay that was done on the forums in 2004, I think, or 2005, which says that the tribunal may have mantled the anticipations. The precise quote is, And so from their basis did we spring, called to heaven by violence, our people throwing our mantles to us across the stars and across time and magic and dream, and here we remain. This is a little different because the anticipations, which are Boethia, Mephala and Azura, aren't gone while the tribunal are around. They're still present, they're still doing things, still interacting with Mundus. 
However, I also think that the context of this remark means that it's not exactly mantling in the metaphysical sense. It feels like mantling as a role, taking up a role in the mundane sense, not mantling as in replacing them within the metaphysical setup of the Arabis. But they do have some similarities, uh, most explicitly in the book Vivek and Mephala, which points out that Vivek acts very similarly to Mephala in a kind of open secret of being this violent, sex-driven thing. But while Z has attributes that are similar to Mephala, and Z did replace her in the Dunma faith, I wouldn't call it a precise attempt at mantling as such, although I'm well aware that some do. And if you've got anything more to add to that, I'd absolutely love to hear some more details on that particular theory. I also think it's worth talking briefly about precisely what can or can't be mantled here. Given that we've got questions about whether there needs to be a space, there's also discussion about, is the last dragonborn mantling Shaw? Is the Nereverine mantling Nerevar? I think the last one of those is fairly obviously not the case, given Michael Kirkbride's quote. But the other ones, where you're talking about gods and so on and so forth, we don't really have that many confirmed examples of mantling to work with. So we can't say for sure what the limits of mantling are, compared to just basic imitation. This is what I can work out, given the examples that we have, but this is not much beyond my own speculation and some uh, similar things that I've seen others come out with. I think overall, mantling is a process whereby an entity gains more power and another identity. I think the more power part of that has to be a, a definite part of it in order for it to be mantling. Otherwise, you're simply imitating something or possibly mentally ill and engaging in some form of dissociative identity disorder. I don't know precisely what the clinical terms would be, but something where you are being another identity in an unhealthy way. As a result of that need to do it to gain more power, I think that the thing you're mantling needs to be above you in terms of creational gradients. This means that mortals imitating other mortals, even if those others are chosen by the gods, doesn't really make much sense to be called mantling. There's an usurpation of the role that they take on, but I wouldn't call it mantling as such, which I think is what's happening with the tribunal. The mantling of Shia Gorath during the Grey March is also touched on by a lawmaster's archive, which can give us a bit more information about the precise processes here. In particular, Haskell mentions that he is a vestige in this quote. I'm a vestige, all that remains of a mortal from your world who mantled at Shia Gorath during an event in a previous time. As a fragment, my memory of the event is fragmentary. I'm hazy on the entire concept of mantling, but it had something to do with Lord Shiagorath, myself, and this jigalag of whom you speak. Now this quote implies that there is some remnant of the original thing left over when it's mantled, or at least there can be. Haskill is different from the Champion of Cyrodiil in that he clearly failed to free jigalag while the Champion of Cyrodiil obviously succeeded. However, does that mean that Haskill didn't mantle Shia Gorath. I'm inclined to say that there was a mantle passed here in the sense of there was a missing gap in the Arabis filled, but that didn't result in Jigalag's defeat. It was a temporary filling that was pushed out on the next Grey March or in some other course of events that Shia Gorath was engaged in. So we do have a situation where Haskell both is and is not Shiagorath at once as a result of the mantling process. That's one thing to bear in mind while I talk about possibly the biggest and most contentious example of mantling that we have and what I started this cast with, which is Talos. According to the orthodox account of the Talos cult and the version of events that gets pushed when he's part of the Nine Divines, Talos is an Atmoran who creates the first empire to conquer and unite all of Tamriel. 
there aren't that many explicit accounts of precisely how he ascended. Looking at a lot of the sources, it's just kind of assumed he gets patted on the head for being a good boy when he dies and joins the Pantheon. Even Heimskir, who's very, very big on the idea of Talos being a man and a god and having been both and how this is wonderful, just kind of hand waves the process. He just ascends. He doesn't go into any more detail than that. But there are a few holes in the overall process and the description of Talos in the orthodox accounts. The most obvious of these is the of at Mora Monica. Talos exists at the end of the Second Era, where the pocket guide to the Empire states the last migrants from at Mora arrived in the 68th year of the First Era, which is well before Talos was born. Now, we don't have any accounts of any kind of expat at Morans who were squirreling away and preserving their culture, so I think it's very unlikely that you'd be able to claim an at Moran identity purely on that basis, given the disparity in the dates. And there's also the fact that there were no mentions of Talos as a god before the Elder Scrolls III. This is a little weird, as you'd expect one of the most pivotal figures in the Defined Pantheon to be a little more prominent throughout its history. There is a whiff of retcon here as well, as Talos is a little shoehorned in in the Elder Scrolls III as the deified Tiber Septim, in my view. He's added in a few references to books here and there, but not much else. As well as picking holes in the conventional in-universe orthodoxy, the kind of one of the major gods of the Cyrodiilic faith, which also defines quite a bit about it, particularly in the Elder Scrolls 4 and 5, just seems to appear out of nowhere. And I should point out that there I'm talking about Talos the god, not Talos the man. Talos as a name for Tiber Septim has been around since Redguard. It was mentioned in the first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire. So the name doesn't come out of nowhere, it's just the deification. So this being the Elder Scrolls, the fans have used a particular text to put together the dots and work out quite what was going on in terms of how Tiber Septim ascended or not, or what on earth was going on to explain the inconsistencies here. The key text here is the Arcturian Heresy, which claims that Tiber Septim was an identity created by a cabal of three men who wanted to run the Empire together. Apart from casting the main Tiber character in a far less flattering light and accusing him of multiple murders as part of his rise to power, it ends with a really interesting scene, which is the basis for thinking of Talos as having mantled in order to achieve his godhead. Pieces of Numidium trickle in, though. Tiber Septim, always fascinated by the dwarves, has Zurin Arctus research this grand artifact. In doing so, Arctus stumbles upon some of the stories of the war at Red Mountain. He discovers the region that the Numidium was made and some of its potential. Most importantly, he learns the Underking's place in the war, but Zurin Arctus was working from incomplete plans. He thinks it's the heart of Lorcan's body that is needed to power the Numidium. While Zurin Arctus is raving about this discovery, the prophecy finally becomes clear to Tiber Septim. This new medium is what he needs to conquer the world. It is his destiny to have it. He contacts the Underking and says he was right all along. They should kill the tribunal and they need to get together to make a plan. While the Underking was away, he realised the true danger of Dagothur, something must be done. But he needs an army and his old one is available again. The trap is set. The Underking arrives and is ambushed by Imperial Guards. As he takes them on, Zurin Arctus uses a soul gem on him. With his last breath, the Underking's heart roars a hole through the Battle Mage's chest. In the end, everyone is dead, the Underking has reverted back to Ash, and Tiber Septim strolls in and takes the soul gem. When the Elder Council arrives, he tells them about the second attempt on his life, this time by his trusted Battle Mage, Zurin Arctus, who is attempting a coup. He has the dead guards celebrated as heroes, even the one who was blasted to ash. He warns Cyril a little about the dangers within, but he has a solution to the dangers without, the Mantella. The Numidian, 
While not the god Tiber Septim and the Duema hoped for, the Underking was not exactly Lorcan after all. It does the job. After its work on Somerset Isle, a new threat appears, a rotting undead wizard who controls the skies. He blows the Numidium apart, but it pounds him into the ground with its last flailings, leaving only a black splotch. The Mantella falls into the sea, seemingly forever. Meanwhile, Tiber Septim crowns himself the first Emperor of Tamriel. He lives until he is 108, the richest man in history. All aspects of his early reign are rewritten. Still, there are conflicting reports of what really happened, and this is why there's such confusion over such questions as why does Alcair claim to be the birthplace of Talos while other sources say he came from Akmora? Why does Tiber Septim seem to be a different person after his first roaring conquests? Why does Tiber Septim portray his battle mage? Is the Mantella the heart of the battle mage, or is it the heart of Tiber Septim? The key for this is the event where the Underking is deceived. We have someone being betrayed and a heart being torn out as part of that betrayal. Now, this sounds very like what happens to Lorcan at convention, where his heart is torn out as punishment for creating the mortal world. However, there are multiple deceptions and betrayals going on here. We have Wolfarth being lured in and soul trapped. Zurin has a hole torn through his chest and dies. And so we've got some questions here over precisely which one is Lokan. The most obvious answer, if we take M. Michael Copebride at his word, is both. M.K. produced a list of people that he considered Shezarines or Shards of Lokan. This list includes all of the various characters involved in this event. We have Talos being Lorcan from all angles, so to speak, and in a sense potentially imitating convention as a whole as well as Lorcan. This is an idea that I discussed in the episode on the Man Mer Schism, if you want to check out that. The key points here are that Talos is Convention 2.0 is the phrase to look for. In brief, it's the idea that Talos mantles not just Lorcan, but convention itself, which fortifies the structure of the Albus by taking the missing god's place. And for those of you tracking the timelines here, this is a little off so far. Tiber Septim unified Tamriel in the Second Era, and Talos only appears as a god after the warp in the West in the 417th year of the Third Era. If the act of mantling was the reenactment of convention as the heresy describes, why didn't it happen then? To understand that, we need a brief recap of the events at the end of The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. One of the endings to the game involves allowing the Underking to use the totem of Tiber Septim to reunite with the part of his soul that's trapped within the Mantella. If you take the heresy as true, the description of Wolfarth's heart getting torn out implies a possible mingling of souls taking place. This means that when the Underking's soul is reunited during the warp, it connects with Wolfarth and consequently all the other bits that are Shezarine's souls, which creates Talos, which wasn't possible while part of those three was bound to the mortal plane as part of the Mantella. As a result, we have Talos as three souls stacked into one, and moreover three potential incarnations of Lorcan. The various participants also take up a range of roles within their lives, if the heresy is to be believed, which in the most common of tellings gets very heavily linked together. The most important of these for mantling, I think, is Ismir, a title which is shared by both Wolfarth and Hjalti, and it's described in Varieties of Faith as the Nordic version of Talos. Ismir, particularly given how the Greybeards talk about him, is a role that some people have taken on, similar to how Redguards consider the Hoonding to be a role that can be taken on by different people at different times. But anyway, we should probably get back to the Hialti Wolfarth Zurin Triumvirate at this point. In some of the more common tellings that I see of this, the three characters involved in the Enantiomorph that the Heresy describes each have two titles applied to them. Hjalti and Wolfarth both have Ismir, and Zurin and Hjalti have Tiber, and then Wolfarth and Zurin have the Underking, all of which link up to make an overlapping diagram to show that how Talos is made up of three and potentially six at once. 
However, this doesn't quite match even what we're given in the heresy, because the heresy gives the title of Tiber Septim two or three. It talks about how the underking is going abroad and how it would be weird if Tiber is seen in multiple places at once. So the so Wolfarth is also assigned the title of Tiber within the heresy. This is in contrast to Skeleton Man's interview, which also identifies Zurin and Talos as Tiber, not Zurin and Hjalti. And so, while Talos is the three combined, it doesn't feel like it's as simple a combination as it's often made out to be. And on top of that, I feel I should probably point out here that this isn't necessarily entirely accurate. There are quite a few leaps made in the heresy that aren't backed up elsewhere, most particularly the linking up of Wolfarth and the Underking, where it's Zurin alone who's the Underking in the game. And there's also no ending in Daggerfall that mentions Tiber's deification, despite the book The Warp in the West explicitly mentioning that people were aware of all the changes that happened surrounding that particular dragon break and that there was a suddenly a set of new kingdoms this was a new event it wasn't something that erased people's memory to make people always think there had been those kingdoms so there's no there was always talos so there should have been a sudden oh there's a new god now but there's no mention of talos appearing as a new god in the way that there is for manimarko to give the most obvious parallel the Arcturian Heresy is also the only text that makes the Talos as a mantling product version of events seem even remotely obvious. It's been taken by many fans to be the truth, particularly given Kirkbride's comments about how he's thought about Tiber as mantling and achieving divinity that way, but there isn't too much evidence backing it up apart from that book. So you'll see regular questions within the Elder Scrolls fandom about how legitimate this whole theory is because of how the book doesn't really fit. There is, however, one more theory I want to discuss regarding Tybe's ascension, which may also involve mantling and replacement. In the books prior to Morrowind, Ebonarm was a god of war in what appears to be several pantheons, and I think most popular in High Rock and around Hammerfell. It's a little vague because official references have kind of disappeared. But it's been suggested by some that rather than mantling Lorcan and taking his place, Talos has instead supplanted Ebonarm as a god of war. It would certainly fit with the militant beginnings of Tiber, and it doesn't require a huge deviation from the orthodox account of his rise that the theory of him mantling Lorcan does. There's also the possible evidence that Ebonarm was subsequently removed from everything that previously mentioned him, implying that this is a whole-scale replacement in the way that we can argue potentially happens with other examples of mantling that we've seen. Although I would say this is usually taken to be an editorial out-of-universe decision that hasn't been entirely explained, I'm also a little sceptical of the idea as beyond conquering things and being a very successful general, Talos did very little that could be linked to Ebonarm and Ebonarm's behaviour. Indeed, the book The Ebon Arm, which details a manifestation of Ebonarm, describes him as a peacemaker who discourages people from making war unnecessarily. You could apply that to Talos, I guess, in a kind of Pax Romana making a desert and calling it peace kind of way, but Talos didn't end conflicts to the mutual benefit of both sides and make conflict seem unnecessary in the way that Ebonarm does in that particular book. So I'm a little sceptical of that, although it is entirely possible given that one of the biggest pieces of the most common mantling theories relies on a single text. It feels like there's enough material, maybe, that you can take whichever story you like, although there does seem to be a rough, unofficial consensus on the matter. Which, I guess, is an appropriate point to draw this cast to a close. Mantling is one of the least well-understood areas of the Elder Scrolls lore, in my opinion, 
as much as there's lots to talk about in it, you'll see an awful lot of talk and theory crafting and conjecture. And as mal as much as that has a fantastic logic to it, we can't confirm much of it at all. The examples that we do have have lots of different ways of expressing what they're doing, lots and they're quite variable, which makes each example pretty much unique, although in theory they are following the same pattern. Mantling involves imitation until the universe thinks that you are a different thing, but what that means for both the original being and the being attempting the mantling feels very unclear at this point. We seem to have multiple answers for how that works. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to listen to this. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. I'm now on most of them out there. And if you fancy a chat, please join the discussion on the Written and Uncertainty Discord server. And just one final note before I go and a plug for further bits on the website. I'm also collating a list of some of the best long form essays on the Elder Scrolls lore that I can find. There are some absolute gems out there in terms of how people have looked at, conceived of the lore and written about them in a magnificent way. And I'm trying to put them all together into a single place where people can find them no matter where they've originally been posted. If you have any that you think should be in there, please let me know and I will post a link to the list as far as it goes so far in the blog post for this cast. And next time, having touched on a few of the ways of achieving godhood in the Elder Scrolls, we're going to look at one of the bigger underlying principles of godhood in the universe. Next time, we're going to be asking, what is Mythopoeia and is Alduin Akatosh? Until then, this podcast remains a letter written in uncertainty. You've been listening to Written in Uncertainty, an Elder Scrolls podcast written and presented by Aramithius. The music for this podcast has been kindly provided by Jan Glembotsky. Check them out on SoundCloud under Songs from the Lost Land, and I'll see you next time.